Hey guys, I'm Nick and welcome back to the channel. Well, today we're talking about Star Trek Picard Season 2, Episode 5, entitled Fly Me to the Moon, which is a bit of a riff on the old Frank Sinatra song. We had a bit of everything in this episode. We had uh, Q returning again. We've got uh, Brent Spiner back in yet another, uh, playing another yet another member of the Sung family. We've also got Issa Briones, who is playing a member of the Sung family as well. We've got shenanigans with the Borg Queen. We've got a Rios prison break. We've got a hark back to original series. Uh, episode uh, Simon Earth featuring Gary Seven. Uh, it had, this episode had a bit of everything for us. Guys, if you haven't subscribed to Sci Fanatics yet, please don't forget to click on that big red button to stay up to date and current with all the latest Star Trek news on YouTube. So let's get into our little breakdown of this week's episode, uh, episode five, season two, Star Trek Picard. So the biggest uh, sort of reveal at the start of this episode was our introduction to the character of Talon, played by uh, Orla Brady, not Laris. Picard thought <laughs> thought she's Laris and kept saying, how are you Laris? Da, da, da. No, 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 she's not Laris. Uh, she is in fact a supervisor. And we get a good reference in this uh, scene here with her and Picard back to the uh, original series episode, Assignment Earth, where we saw um, a operative or supervisor, Gary Seven, who was kind of uh, overseeing, you know, a, uh, another astronaut, I believe, who was a lot, of, a lot of supervisors on Earth overseeing astronauts or whatever, making sure that all the astronauts are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it's Talon's job to oversee Rene Picard, Picard's uh, ancestor, who uh, basically is meant to go on this big Europa mission, um, which obviously is the event that uh, the Q is trying to mess with, because if the Europa mission doesn't happen, everybody gets really kind of insular and xenophobic and we hate everybody, and then it becomes the Confederation. So they want to make sure that uh, Rene Picard uh, does what she's meant to do, and that's what Talon's here to uh, oversee and protect. There's a bunch of internet chatter during the week or whatever. People were sort of saying, oh, is, is she going to be like a guardian of forever because she kind of had a doorway thing open up. Uh, people were saying, oh, does she, is she Isis, Gary Seven's cat? Uh, well, um, at this stage, no, but you, you never know. Um, we haven't kind of explained why she looks like Laris in the future yet. That's sort of still a bit of a, a weird kind of mystery that's yet to be solved. Uh, but still, it was nice to get that hark back to the original series episode of Simon Earth. Uh, I think that was a nice little link. And it's great to have Orla Brady back as uh, as a, a role of some kind in as part of our team for this season. This episode also saw the introduction of a new Sung, a new Dr. Sung. We've had, we've had uh, Brent Spiner play many incarnations of Sung family members over the years from obviously, you know, he's played Data and he's played Laura and he's played Dr. Noonien Sung as an old man and he's played Eric Sung as a um, geneticist back in the Enterprise episode where he was sort of responsible in uh, messing about with the augments. There was even a blink and you'd miss it reference to the uh, eugenics wars where uh, one of the doctors on the panel spoke about Dr. Sung's involvement with genetically engineering soldiers. So there's sort of a very, very subtle reference there to Khan and the other genetically engineered sort of super soldiers. And now he's playing another uh, geneticist as well. So obviously they're continuing the geneticist uh, uh, angle on his family line because we know that he, he kind of his family uh, leading up into Archer's point in the timeline is a geneticist or whatever so we're kind of taking a, a step from that character uh, but yeah good to see Brent Spiner uh, back in a role this season and not only Brent Spiner but also Issa Briones uh, she plays uh, the daughter Corey Sung which kind of makes sense I guess I mean we've got Daj and Soji as the daughters of Data um, and you know obviously he did the painting it was called Daughter and you know maybe there's like some sort of you know link in the Sung family family or whatever that it was an you know, ancient grandmother or whatever who, who was Corey Song. I guess that was good because I, I, I sort of felt bad like I guess at the start of the season thinking oh geez is, is Issa Brioni not even going to be in this season at all um, but it seems we've found a little role for her. As per my analysis in the uh, the photos that came out the other day we kind of worked out that she would have probably going to be ill with some kind of uh, condition which I was correct on <laughs> and uh, that basically uh, the little blue vial that uh, Q was passing Dr. Sung's way was in fact a treatment of for whatever condition she happened to be suffering from. In this case we find out she's got some sort of almost some vampirism kind of condition where she can't go out in the sunlight without being uh, 
basically burnt alive. Uh, so she needs some sort of anti-vampire type treatment to solve this condition for her. And that's where Q comes in. It seems like Q's powers are either gone or extremely limited. He's really having to basically put people to work in order to, uh, to get what he needs done because he can't just do the old finger snap and all of a sudden things are the way he wants them to be. He has to kind of manipulate people a little bit more. Uh, he still has the knowledge. Obviously he was able to give Dr. Sung the little vial with the cure in it. So he's still able to, you know, use his uh, vast Q knowledge to produce what he needs to get the job done, but he just can't snap his fingers and, and have everything change at a click. Q's being very devious. He's taking the role of the therapist here, talking to uh, Renee Picard, trying to convince her not to go on the whole uh, Europa mission. Uh, he's obviously influencing Dr. Sung by giving him the antidote that his daughter needs to be well and uh, have that over him. He can certainly be very cunning and very... Uh, very manipulative, but obviously his, uh, his ability to use his powers has been uh, substantially reduced. There was no real surprises with the Rios breakout. Pretty much every uh, moment of the Rios breakout scene we'd kind of seen before in, in umpteen different trailers that have come out, uh, you know, which obviously show, you know, Seven and Raffi doing the whole EMP pulse, pulse on the bus and, uh, you know, Rios punching out the guard and everybody getting out off the bus. Well, there was that one little moment that was a bit of a surprise, which was the fact that when all of the detainees got off the bus, one of them was Elnor. And Raffi thought it was Elnor, but then when he turned around, it was um, somebody else who wasn't Elnor. Um, so obviously, uh, yeah, Raffi's, um, she's having trouble coping with uh, the death of Elnor. And she's sort of starting to see things, which you know, maybe means she's sort of having, you know, a bit of trouble coping. As I mentioned in my uh, video the other day about the photos that came out for this episode, it was kind of weird to see all of our b uh, board of geneticists or whatever that were reprimanding Dr. Sung or whatever just have their table in the middle of a hallway. That kind of seemed a little bit odd. Our uh, vice chair on the right of frame in this shot is none other than Dr. Vasily Roshenko. Now, Roshenko sounds familiar, and that's because Worf's adopted human parents, Sergei, and I forget his mum's name, Roshenko was the uh, people that adopted Worf and raised him on Earth or whatever after his parents were killed uh, at the Kitima conference. Having the Borg Queen get up to her sneaky tricks, hacking into the cell phone lines to call the police so that uh, they can send a security guard out to the chateau and everything to infect him with uh, nanoprobes so that, that he can do the bidding of the Borg Queen uh, doesn't quite go the way I thought it would. I thought I was quite surprised when, uh, you know, Girardi shot the Borg Queen in the head. I thought, oh, this is a bit unexpected. They kind of need the Borg Queen to get back to the future, pardon the pun. Thought, well, she has to kind of hang around because without her, they're kind of stuck in the in the 21st century. But it would seem that this is taking a little bit of a, a different turn in the sense that uh, before she died, she gets the whole nanoprobes into Girati. Um, and I'm guessing this is going to play out very interestingly in the, um, in the course of the season with... Uh, Girardi influenced by a, a, a sizable dose of Borg Queen nanoprobes. So whether this means the Borg Queen's trying to turn her into another Borg Queen, whether or this means she's just going to have some, you know, some subconscious influence on her, we need to wait and see uh, what, how that's going to play out. But obviously we've got uh, some stealthy uh, capers going on at the gala event with, uh, with Renee Picard. They've got to um, convince her to go on the mission. We've obviously got Q who's been trying to talk her out of it. And obviously Picard and the rest of our gang have to talk her back into it, get her, get her confidence up, get her uh, all ready to take on the, the mission and head out to uh, Europa which is apparently while she's in Europa, she finds some sort of uh, sentient microorganism, which was a sort of an interesting turn of events. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's not like she can land on Europa or Io, I would have thought. I thought they were just sort of going some sort of, you know, Europa mission to sort of, you know, um, circumnavigate the moons of Jupiter or something and come back to Earth again. But um, I'm not sure how she manages to uh, land on Io and um, have a chat with some sort of sentient um, 
a little bug or creature or something, you know, a little insect or something, a little amoeba swimming in the little swamp there on Aya or something, which, you know, says, hello, hello. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure how that plays out, but it clearly happened. It'll be interesting to see how Dr. Sung uh, responds to uh, the blackmail that Q's putting him through in terms of giving him the uh, the full antidote, because he only gave Corey a kind of a half dose, not even a half dose, a dose that lasted like half an hour or something, because uh, obviously uh, she started to be affected by the sun again and uh, Dr. Sung had to bring in his little UV protecting drones. We're just like, oh, okay, this is a bit high tech. Like we're, we're only meant to be in 2024 and yet we've got these hovering laser interconnected drones that obviously put up some sort of... Um, you know, anti-UV screen. It's like that's, this seems quite quite advanced. Like, surely just a bit of bit of shade cloth or something over the pool would, or you know, or maybe some sort of um, you know, a louvered roof might be a, a preferable idea, and, and certainly a bit more cost-effective than all these little fancy drones that put out a web of uh, of anti-UV uh, screening. Um, uh, energy fields. It's like this. This is pretty high tech. Like what you can make one of these drone sunshade webs, but you can't, you know, solve a genetic issue. I guess he's better at uh, programming uh, anti UV drones than uh, than uh, he is at uh, being a geneticist. All in all, I really enjoyed this episode. The story is so continuous. It sort of feels like rather than having an episode and then another episode, it's like I'm watching a ten hour movie that I'm just sort of pausing, you know, er after every fifty minutes which has its own charm and everything. I don't, you know, I don't mind the whole season being serialised, providing the story is engaging. And I think it is. I think we're getting some, you know, interesting um, storytelling. We're getting, getting all of our characters, some of them in different roles. The story is kind of playing out a little bit along the lines of um, Star Trek First Contact in the sense that our heroes had to protect an event in the timeline. In that case, it was make sure First Contact happened. They had to convince Zephram Cochran uh, to, to fly the Phoenix mission. And, and this season of Picard, we're having to uh, protect uh, Renee Picard and make sure that she flies the Europa mission so that the future will, you know, happen. So it's kind of quite similar in a lot of respects to the plot of Star Trek First Contact in the sec in the sense that our crew is is yeah guarding over a, a, an important historical figure that does some sort of important astronomical or space travel based event that changes uh, the future so that everybody you know, is the way we remember it and we have the Federation and Starfleet and, and you know, uh, all the good things that come along with that. So, yeah, there's certainly a lot of um, similarities there. Guys, let me know your thoughts in the comment section, what you thought of this episode. Uh, let me know. Please leave a super thanks if you're able to. It really helps the channel out. Much appreciated. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. And check out my merch in the merch store where everything is 20% off at the moment. You can pick up uh, all the cool uh, hoodies, mugs, caps, t-shirts, all that sort of thing for 20% off until until the 4th of April. So that's a, a good uh, a good little chunk of time there. You got to pick up something on a bargain price at the merch store. Uh, I'll be back soon for my next video. I'll see you guys soon.